Jones, the daily morning show where we talk about the latest topics in entertainment. I'm Brittany Jones Cooper. I'm Shannon Coffey. I'm Allie Colbert. And I'm Lucas Tim. Hi, everyone. Woo. Hi. Welcome. Happy Friday. Today, we're going to talk about a museum dedicated to pizza lovers, the ongoing Sex in the City feud between Sarah Jessica Parker and Kim Cattrall, and Justin Timberlake's Coachella announcement. Plus, Fiverr Chief Digital Nomad Ch Chelsea Odufu joins the table, and Riverdale creator Roberto Aguirre Sacasa and actress Michelle Gomez stop by to discuss their new project, The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina on Netflix. Woo! All excited for that. Um, before we begin, I have a little first course. It's a little bit more serious than our usual ones, but I don't know if you guys saw that Amy Schumer, along with model Emily Budatowski, yeah. along with many other people, were arrested um, in D.C. protesting the Kavanaugh um, confirmation in the Senate. It was, yeah. I don't know if you guys watched it. It was pretty powerful to see all these people like standing together to protest yeah. this nomination because the FBI investigation or background check came back when they've only interviewed nine to ten people, didn't contact his roommate or interview Dr. Ford or even Kavanaugh. So yeah. what a great investigation. Yeah. But um, Amy Schumer did get arrested. Amy yeah. Schumer is super political and it's like really <laughs> kind of funny. Like I remember when, but I'm glad that she was protesting yeah. this. I mean, I really support protesting this. Yeah. Um, but I saw when uh, we had the New York uh, race with Cynthia Nixon, uh, she endorsed uh, Cuomo and then the next day posted being like, sorry, I had to go with my heart and I voted Cynthia. What? <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> missed <Instagram>. that. <laughs> it was like, what are you, and she never addressed the fact that she endorsed both candidates. And that <laughs> is the epitome of Amy Schumer in politics. <laughs> that is she came out and was honest about it. Yeah. Um, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm happy to see her on the right side of history this time because in 2016, I was pretty disappointed with her and her stance on one of her writers who was, um, you know, mm -hmm. being written up for being very problematic online, attacking women, um, uh, you know, not supporting assault victims. And he was kind of pretty much victim blaming. Mm -hmm. And people asked her to, to speak up on that. And she just kind of was like, yeah, I don't support it, but I'm not going to like, yeah, you know, right, say anything against that. it. And right. that was really, really, a, uh, like, that was just like so disappointing because, you know, she is supposedly a feminist and mm -hmm. I would hope that she'd always take that hard stand. So I'm glad that she's putting herself on the line. Mm -hmm. She definitely, you know, can take the hit. Yeah, I think people sometimes are on like an evolution with their stances and Amy's definitely been one of those as you guys just described. But I think it does show that in a moment like this, a lot of people are finding that they can no longer sit back yeah. and just kind of watch things happen. And so it is nice to see her and Emily and just all the women right. who are out there speaking their truth. And like, it, it you have to do something actionable. Totally. And it's just like nice to see. And it's difficult, these women. I mean, the fact, I don't know if you've seen the video when they confront these senators and yeah. speak their truth. And Senator Orrin Hatch flat out told a group of women to grow, grow up. Yeah. Which yeah. is so incredibly offensive. And But you know, the bravery these women have, and uh, like you said, Amy yeah. Schumer supporting them, I think that's a good thing overall. And so many yeah. teens, I think, you know, this conversation has been dominated by adults, but you know, the, the case we're talking about happened to teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing teenagers come out and speak against, not against, but speak to senators and tell them their stories and how they're living this reality right now and how much it impacts when you send that message that like what happens as a teen doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's really Our crazy. children are listening, they're learning from this and it's heartbreaking. So I hope that, I hope something happens and that <laughs> we don't end up just being like, and. <laughs> Again, we're just burning alive. Yeah, <laughs> I think today could be a really emotional day for a lot of people. Yeah. So just if you do go out in the streets, if you are protesting, just make sure be make sure you're being safe, safe. and take care of your friends. But we support you definitely. Yeah. So Woo. yeah, yeah, wrap it up. We believe in America we believe. still. <laughs> All right. So ten-time Grammy winner Justin Timberlake is reportedly reportedly set to headline Coachella next April, according to U.S. Weekly. This will be Timberlake's first performance at the major music festival. There's also speculation that Kanye West and Childish Gambino may also perform. Justin Timberlake and Kanye West don't spoil me now. <laughs> There's so Ooh. much goodness. Two of the greats. Wow. Uh, I'm so over both of them. I mean, who really? This just basically means I won't be going to Coachella yet again. It's right. It's very interesting to go from like Beyonce, like wow, everyone wants to go see this, to Justin yeah. Timberlake. Okay, so yeah, don't need to spend the money on this one. And what happened with, with Justin Timberlake? He was, so he was in NSYNC. Yeah, yeah. That, okay. sorry. <laughs> he, and then recently he came out with that song that was sort of like Bonnie Vare. Man in the Woods, that Man whole album. Man in the Woods, yeah. that was a flop, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay, so I used to love Justin Timberlake. Right. I went to his concerts. I loved when he really had it, his identity of being like this male pop star. When he's crossing over into the country world and doing wearing camo. Well, it looks at like he walked into a hunting Bowl. shop and just. I think out he's some lost his identity a little bit, and it's hard <laughs> for me to support him as an artist because the music he's making is just weak. I mean, it's just not good, and he knows it's not good. I think he's. Tr I think he's on a journey. Yeah. So I'll support him as an artist. I but like he needs to bring it back. He needs to get Pharrell get back in the studio. Three. Pharrell needs to be a part of the Coachella performance for sure. I think that's when Justin's at his best. Yeah, um, I totally agree. Yeah. I think he, this we're suffering a little bit from him not having really his own style. I think he's been appropriating for years. Yeah. And now he's like, I gotta switch it up. What else should I pull from? Oh, I'm lost. He <laughs> definitely is in the dark, just reaching out. Yeah. Um, but again, I'll say it, Justin Timberlake is strongest when he's doing trolls. So I, <laughs> I really hope this Coachella is just troll centric, <laughs> you know? Don't stop the music. That's literally been his biggest hit in 10 years. He's just yeah. keep yeah. Up that. Um, even though, you know, he hasn't released a song that I've liked in a good time, uh, he is such a talented performer. Totally. He's an amazing dancer, and I love seeing him work his little booty up there. Well, mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think he's actually really talented. He's a really good songwriter. He's a good producer. He's a really good performer. That's why his Super Bowl performance, to me, was disappointing, because I felt he could put in a lot more effort. Yes. I've said this before. If any female artist did what he did, they would have been destroyed because yeah. I think like look yeah. at Lady Gaga, Beyonce, these women who put so much effort into it and he was just kind of like, oh, we did this like a week before and look how fun it is. Let's take a selfie with this kid. Ah. Lady and Gaga literally jumped so into right. like a black hole well, yeah. and disappeared. Yeah. yeah, and Madonna was doing <laughs> cartwheels it's, and had gla yeah. like gladiators to, like carrying a throne. Like I was like, whoa, yeah. it's like these women put so much effort into it. He just like walks up and like, I'm, I'm gonna, wearing a camo suit. Cool. <laughs> I'm going to say yeah. a controversial statement, but I think Justin Timberlake needs to bring back his ramen noodle hair. Ooh. This cut isn't doing mm -hmm. it. I think he needs the ramen noodles back. Mm -hmm. They're so crispy, so nice, and so <laughs> delicious. Who doesn't want to watch, you know, a sexy man move with some ramen on his head? Right. That's the, it's gonna be me, just yeah. 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 I love it. You, you need him back. Yeah. yeah. I, I just, I, I don't know how many people are going to go to Coachella for him. They might show up for Childish Gambino, who I thought, was last childish? time we discussed, he said that he was going to be done touring, but if he does this, maybe the paycheck was too big to ignore. Yeah. I guess. I don't know. What is Kanye going to be doing at Coachella? Is he going to turn it into a MAGA rally? Go the fuck home, Seriously. Kanye. Seriously. It's like no a... one cares. They're not going to Coachella to listen to you fucking pontificate and hear yourself talk about Yeezys and Donald Trump. Oh, he's Trump. totally going to But can't you already see there. it happening? He's going to be like, everyone's going to be listening. They're going to be stoned. He's going to be like, by the way, <laughs> listen to your heart and be a slave. Like, what yeah. are you yeah. saying? It's exactly. going to ruin everyone's high there, for sure. Yeah. It's, or he'll just show up in like a Aquafina bottle. Like, <laughs> yeah. we, we don't know at this it's different point. Water. <laughs> We don't just know where he's gonna go. <laughs> Next week it's Sasani. Yeah. It yeah. might just go different different beverages. Right. That yeah. would be. That could that be a thing. Fun. Have you guys been to Coachella? I've been once. Really? I yeah. Been yeah. I spent the only white girl at the table. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I spent most of the time eating and trying to find a place to sit. But I had fun. You know, it's good. <laughs> Well, well, calling all pizza lovers, your prayers have been answered. Get ready to take a slice out of the Pizza Experience, a museum dedicated solely to pizza. The multi-sensory pop-up exhibit opened in LA recently and features a pizza apartment, pizza gym, and even pizza box castle. The experience will run through January before taking a deep dive into Chicago. Finally, Museum of Culture. Something we really want to see. I, America. You guys, I have tickets to go to the pizza pop-up in New York next weekend. You really? Yeah. The pizza <laughs> pop-up museum in New York. And I went to the candy pop-up last week, and I went to the ice cream pop-up last year. What is yeah. the joy in food pop-ups? I don't quite un understand. So basically, you just go and like try a bunch of that. Like uh -huh. it's for yeah. foodies. Like I really like ice cream, and I love pizza. Um, I went to the candy one, but that was a birthday gift. Oh. And people know I like food. <laughs> you go and you try like all of the varieties. Like, didn't you go to an ice cream? I one? went to an ice cream one in LA, which really it's like a classic LA like Instagram thing. You go to get like really great pictures and stuff. Yeah. But they do have different ice cream flavors and around each room you go <laughs> in or cool. whatever. And they had a big like ball pit that oh sprinkle sorry sprinkle pit yes, yeah. sprinkle pit and you jump in and take pictures and like. You know, See, I was just waiting for you guys to confess that it's just all about the oh, Instagram picture. I got over 100 yeah. likes of that picture. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> all for that. It is about the photo.
photos, but I'm honestly there for the food. And they have so yeah. much free food that I usually bring a big bag and try and just <laughs> take, as much, take as much as possible home to make my ticket price worth, worth it. it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I get so creeped out by the sprinkles pits and things mm. like that because so like charming. everybody jumps Ooh. in there and they're like putting their tongue out and licking the sprinkles mm. and then leaving uh -huh. the wet sprinkles there and yeah. you're like, Bleh! and then people come out and they're like, I have the flu, I don't know what happened. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, you asshole. Yeah, how'd I get sick? <laughs> yeah, they're like, I don't know. I yeah. was like sanitizing. <laughs> I love that this thing has a pizza gym because for me that's really triggering. Uh, I used to belong to Planet Fitness. <laughs> and on like the first Monday of every month, they would bring in Domino's pizza and the entire gym would just smell like marinara sauce and guilt. Yeah. And you'd be like working out and you're like, why did they bring pizza? Why? Oh, you think that helps you? No, I think it's a horrible thing to do to a person <laughs> to put pizza in a gym. Why yes. on yeah. earth would they do that? That's to trigger fitness. you and to make you earn your membership. It's like, well, you gotta keep coming back because you're eating pizza. That it's like, or, it's, or, or it's like, who are we kidding? You're, you're going to Planet Fitness. We're not, this is not <laughs> for real, guys. no sense. That's like the Sex and the City episode when the Weight Watchers is located yes. right next to the right. uh, Krispy Kreme. Guys, it's all very strategic. Yeah. They should have a room, uh, like a counseling room for people who like pineapple on their pizza. Oh. Because yeah. I feel like the pizza community is so mean to us. What? Yeah, and I like, do. Okay, you do too. Right? Oh yeah, it's yeah. disgusting. That's nasty. And you guys, people get oh, so Oh, a table up divided. Why do you yeah. want pineapple on pizza? That is pizza? so wrong. Why I'm, don't you want pineapple, pineapple somewhere on pizza? else? Take no, it somewhere it's else. It's just like it doesn't, ha it doesn't have to be so dramatic. I feel like people, like families, like tear. Like are torn apart through this, and yeah. I'm just like, it's not that big a deal. Like literally, like if you suggest pineapple pizza, like at a family dinner, they're like, get the fuck out, leave my house, and you're like, what? Uncle Bob is like straight out of jail for dating a 14 year old. Like kick him out, and they're like, no, you. And you're like pineapple pizza's not that bad. See, that we had a pineapple. A that was a, yeah. <laughs> I had a pineapple pizza uncle. family. Like we would order Hawaiian pizza on the regular. Why? Why? Is that People put in anchovies Nebraska? on their pizza. How Again, is that any disgusting. better? That's disgusting. Nothing is better than a plain cheese pizza. Or that's pepperoni. Or pepperoni, or a nice margarita. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that yeah. is nothing better. Mozzarella. But sometimes you switch it up. <laughs> a in mozzarella. Throw some Canadian uh, bacon yeah, and some pineapple on it, sometimes. You know? Oh, come on. Pineapple? Do you like that sweet, fruity it's taste? It's with the Canadian yeah. bacon on the proper crust. It can be a really delightful oh. experience. I'm sorry, I just threw Who up a little in my mouth. <laughs> my mother? Your yeah. mom? <laughs> Are you what about you? What? The internet. The internet? Yeah. But, how but you had it growing up? No. Really? Oh. So you had it late in life? Yeah. Wow. Whoa. Wow. I thought you were born that way. Yeah. No. <laughs> you're born that's a good question. Are you yeah. born with this or is it because of culture? Now let's oh, see. Oh, I wonder. I know. I think it's just like some people are born with it. Other people just like it grows like a little tumor. Right. You know, <laughs> I hate it so much, but I've never even tried it. See, Ali. Yeah, look at you. You're such a little hater. Yeah. <laughs> you know what you. See? We've both never this tried it. I don't want to ruin, I don't ruin pizza. But it's, I, but I, I don't want to ruin it either. It's yeah. like gross to me. It's like no. getting See, now this conversation is null and void until now yeah. next week I'm going to have to bring no, freaking Hawaii. We here. have tried it. We have. Oh, tried. stop lying! You lie on the show I have, so no, much. I have not. I have not tried it. I don't think <laughs> I, I want to try it. You so love that zebra cake I brought. Like, I'm lying. lying. <laughs> that was cake. Out. I love cake. But, but pineapple pizza. I don't know. I mean. That's wrong. That's wrong. Yeah, I you don't, don't know. Like, you don't, don't, don't put that on Nebraska. People eat Hawaiian pizza all the time. I'm about to say, how's the pizza in Nebraska? Don't put that on Nebraska. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm from Puerto Rico <laughs> and we did it, so no big deal. <laughs> Puerto Rico makes sense because it's a little tropical in Nebraska. Yeah. What the fuck you do yeah. fucking around with pineapple pizza? It's so How the pineapple even get there? Nebraska's super tropical. Why? Yes, man. Yeah. It used to be an ocean. Yeah, Nebraska's like, Nebraska? everybody's always like, the Ogallala wearing flip -flops. Aquifer. Look it up, guys. It's yeah. geology. The Ogallala Aquifer? <laughs> yeah, Nebraska used to be underwater. Guys, come on. Like, what? Can, yeah. like, that is so with dinosaurs? Made up. Yeah, and there's dinosaurs there too. That's yeah. not a reason for you to have pineapple pizza in your house. <laughs> I don't even know how we got we there. We should be debating I'm Chicago versus New York pizza, See? not pineapple. <laughs> this just proves that they need a counseling room <laughs> for the pineapple issue right. in this pizza museum. You're right, you're right. Yeah, that, I just got defensive. That should be an added room. It's counseling. Therapist yeah. sits there like we need to talk. Yeah. We're gonna we'll pick this up later. It's, uh, <laughs> now it is time for one of our special guests. Chelsea Adufu has a job that most people only dream about: a chief digital nomad position at Fiverr, where she travels around the globe, learning what it takes to build a small business and be an entrepreneur outside the United States. Take a look. Hey everybody, it's Chelsea Odufu, Fiverr Sheet Digital Nomad, and I'm here in Hanoi, Vietnam, starting off my four-month journey through Southeast Asia. Over the next four months, I'll be traveling through Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, and then Japan, capturing inspiring stories of entrepreneurs and doers. What I love about working remotely is that you're constantly going personally and professionally, meeting new people that will push your perspective while experiencing a completely different cultural reality. 
Vietnam is a great country for digital nomading, as it offers plenty of chic cafes and workspaces, and you can get Wi-Fi pretty much anywhere. So I'm so excited to share my journey with you as Fiverr's chief digital nomad, and make sure you stay tuned to all of our social platforms, at Fiverr, and even my social platform, at Chelsea Director. Peace. Everyone, please give a warm Build Brunch welcome to Chelsea Aduku. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. We're happy to have you. So can you describe uh, what it means so that for people who don't know, what it means to be a chief digital nomad? Awesome. Um, so a chief digital nomad ultimately is somebody who travels the world um, and creates content for brands um, and is working remotely. So they're making their own lifestyle. Traveling is a priority for them, but they're able to kind of craft a, a lifestyle for themselves where they can do work yeah. and live their best life. Yeah. Um, so it's awesome. So are you in the middle of traveling right now? I mean, or you're in New York right now? Yeah, so I'm in New York right now. I just completed uh, my position with Five Res, their chief digital nomad. So I was sent to Asia for four months, Japan, Malaysia, Thailand, and uh, oh my God, Vietnam, um, to interview entrepreneurs, decision makers on what the entrepreneurial landscape kind of looks mm -hmm. like in those countries. So. Wow, and how did you win that job? So I applied for it. It was like a, a, over over a thousand people applied. Um, I, I think I was one of the. I heard I was one of the third people to apply for the position. Um, so they just gave it to. Them. <laughs> no, but I mean, I felt, I felt confident. I felt confident about the job. Um, I was I was kind of in between traveling to Senegal. I was like, am I going to go to Senegal? I saw in the application they said if you won, you'll get a flight back to New York. Great. So I bought it one way, and I was like. <laughs> Hopefully the universe is in my favor. Yeah. Um, and the universe held it down and I got a free flight back <laughs> home. <laughs> and I was able to um, start the journey as a chief digital nomad for an awesome company. So wow. it was amazing. That is That's so cool. That's incredible. Yeah. You though are a filmmaker. You yes. actually went to Tish with yes. our friend Ali over yes. here. Yes. Film yes, and TV, did. which is an incredible program. You're very talented. You've worked Thank for you. Spike Lee and you've done a ton of internships. So what made you want to apply for this role? Um, so I think that as a filmmaker, I was looking to kind of break out of, or, or kind of really hone in on my voice. I feel like sometimes you can get overwhelmed with group thought and then kind of the messaging that everybody who kind of looks like you is putting out in the film industry. Um, and as a Caribbean and African, I really wanted to ground my voice and authenticity. So I started traveling to Africa and the Caribbean, doing residencies and exploring, um, just so that I, the, the things that I'll be hearing, seeing, would just be different than the mm -hmm. typical narratives that I was hearing in America. Um, so that kind of is what started me my, my, like jump started my whole right. idea of wanting to travel. So I first started going to Senegal, spent, spent about five months in Senegal, really loved being on my own in a country that I didn't speak any English. Mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of was like, you know what, I'm trying to do this and I can't keep funding it. So hopefully, you know, I get this job. So I did. And uh, like I said, it was awesome um, working for a company that I really feel like I aligned with the mission of being like a doer. Yeah. So, so it sounds great. like you got to do some amazing travel. Yeah. What was one country that you really feel like you were able to fully experience and enjoy? Japan, Japan yeah. definitely, Japan was awesome. Um, I lived in Kyoto and um, also traveled to Tokyo. Um, and it was during the Gion Mitsuri Festival, which is like this huge traditional festival. So everywhere in Kyoto was just like, it was just super Japanese, I don't know. But <laughs> J Japan is, uh, I feel like a very culturally strong place. Yeah. Uh, Japanese are very prideful of being J Japanese. So it's cool to go to a country where they're not like performing their identity for like a Western palette, but really just like, this is who we are. You have to like it or not, yeah. but we're Japanese. So, and Japanese food, Japanese food is awesome. I met so many great people um, and made lifelong friends. I feel like in Japan while I was there. So, yeah. by far, yeah, everybody should go to Japan. I've been, and what you're saying is totally spot on. Yeah. And this whole digital nomad experience is becoming more and more popular. There's groups like Remote Year, yeah. where they really kind of help facilitate. This I was on Remote Year. Oh, okay. Well, we'll talk yeah. about that later because okay. I applied for it and got it. Um, <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's a thing that's like becoming yeah. a thing. Why do you think it's so appealing, especially to millennials, to like have this freedom? I think millennials are are, are just inspired to be entrepreneurs. I think that we're kind of moving past, uh, solely want to work for nine to five. We're, we're hustlers in general. So I think that for me, traveling was something that I always saw as something that I would be able to do when I reached the pivot, like the, the height of my career. Yeah. Um, as almost as a reward. Like I needed to reward myself for like all these years of labor. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, that's actually kind of funny. But <laughs> you guys got why that was funny. But, um, but, but then I was like, you know what? I can start traveling now. And I wanted to find ways to kind of incorporate that in my lifestyle now. And I saw it as something that it was just a matter of me changing 
Like, instead of going to brunch on Sundays, maybe I'll, like, save that money and buy a cheap flight out of the country. Yeah. So um, I think millennials just like the freedom to be able to make their own schedule to pursue the things that they really want to pursue um, and no longer wanting to just like work for jobs where they're unhappy and are like, dang, I got to go home and yeah. hate this tomorrow. So yeah, I don't yes. know. Having traveled and met so many different people and entrepreneurs, what is your advice for entrepreneurs looking to start their own business or starting out? For sure. Um, I think that the, the main thing is to know what, you're, what you stand for, like your mission. So having a voice is in a brand, like a clear brand is a thing I feel like which sets people apart. So once you have a brand, then it's easier for you to be able to productize and market whatever your services are because you know how people are going to connect yeah. with you. Um, so again, my, my six, I feel like my film career kind of jump started when I made my film or, you know, in search of self with my brother. Um, and it was a solid product. Right. So now I had a product that I was able to pitch to different people, mm -hmm. platforms. Like I, I started a, a career as like a, like a motivational speaker. Yeah. I've been speaking at schools, my brother and I, at Yale, Harvard. So just like it all started off with me knowing my voice, standing firm in my voice and my brand, but then also having a product to kind of market and shop around. Um, so that is the simplest, I feel like, advice. And just a lot of hustle, finesse, like networking, infiltrating scenes. Occasionally but give up that brunch so you can play that Exactly. Plane Occasionally give up that brunch. brunch if you can buy a plane ticket. <laughs> hey, mean, brunch is expensive. Brunch can add up. Yeah. Yeah. Brunch, yeah. brunch is. It can yeah. go all yeah. Sunday. <laughs> a lot of drinks. Right? Yeah. Oh, and the after, part, the after move. Yeah. yeah. After brunch. Yeah. After I love brunch. that you're giving speeches at Yale and Harvard because I remember when we were in the back of the history of animation final <laughs> exam, Googling the answer. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. what? No, right? But like, things we, change. You know? Completely thinking we're going to fill that class like yo I don't even know but yeah um, I think speaking at, at Yale was awesome for me because I mean I only have a bachelor's um, and again that's another thing in my life where I thought I had to have a PhD or I had to be super uh, yeah intellectual or I am super intellectual educated but like you know just had all these accolades connected to me as a speaker to be able to do it mm -hmm. um, and it was cool to like bring my homies like my, my friends who worked on the film my brother and like we spoke at the black the first place we spoke at was Yale Black Solidarity Conference which had about 700 students from all over the country um, which allowed me to kind of jumpstart a hope but yeah it, it I constantly have moments in my life where at one point something seems very impossible and then I do it and I'm like I could have done this the whole time <laughs> like yeah. I might have been sleeping on my own self so I think that is being a digital nomad filmmaker, I'm just constantly surprising myself at my own potential, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you tell us about your new film, Black Lady Goddess? Uh, Black Lady Black Goddess, Lady Goddess. And <laughs> um, like, just kind of your inspiration for that. Yeah. Um, so Black Lady Goddess is an Afrofuturistic web series set in a time where the last humans on Earth now have connection to their creator in outer space, mm. who they find out is a black woman. Um, so it pretty much uh, the season kind of follows Earth as this chaos unfolds with this news now hitting and some of the decisions that Black Lady Goddess makes now that everybody knows that she's God. Mm -hmm. um, so I love it. I mean, I think I've been, I was inspired by a lot of different things. Uh, my frustration with cultural appropriation, like I'm annoyed when I see like Kim K on Vogue being like raved about by Ooh. having cornrows and braids or like also I'm inspired by, uh, I mean, Afrofuturism in general kind of takes a lot of neglected African histories mm -hmm. um, and merges it with a sci-fi aesthetic. Um, so I'm very inspired by the Adogan tribe in Mali. Um, they have a very alternative creation narrative. So that's kind of many different things, whether or not it be just like creation narratives, looking at different, where do we come from, and those questions, as well as just like me being frustrated about simple things like cornrows yeah. being raved about on Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had cornrows forever. Right. So Forever. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's kind of what inspired it. I think uh, I think it's awesome. I think so many people are going to connect to it. We're in the we're still in this. We've always been in Black Girl Magic World, but I think um, especially with Black Panther, when I was I made Black Lady Goddess before Black Panther, mm -hmm. but now that Black Panther's out, I feel like people yeah. get what Afro features in it. They're like, oh, Black <laughs> Panther. I'm like, yeah, kind of, like, <laughs> kind of, kind of yeah. a little bit, you know, um, not quite, but you, you people are getting it now, so that's awesome. Yeah, well, timing is perfect. You have done such awesome work, and we're excited to see what you continue to thank do. Thank you. Chelsea, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you for having me. Everyone, make sure to check out Chelsea's latest projects on her website, www.ochelsea.com. Also, check out Fiverr.com to learn more about Chelsea's cool job. Ooh, thank you.
Well, attention Sex and the City fans, new developments have surfaced in the feud between co-star Sarah Jessica Parker and Kim Cattrall. The latest news in the ongoing rivalry includes a comment from Sarah Jessica Parker on an Instagram post addressing a fan asking to replace or write out Kim. Parker replied back saying, not sure if I can imagine doing another movie without her. When asked about the feud on Watch Happens Live with Andy Cohen, this is what Parker's response was. What was your reaction to Kim Cattrall telling Piers Morgan that you were never friends, just colleagues? Uh, just heartbroken. I mean, that whole week, you and I spoke yeah. about it endlessly, because I was just, I don't know, I was really, I don't know, I found it very upsetting, because that's, you know, that's not the way I recall our experience. So, right. it's... Sad, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of um, I don't know. I always think that what ties us together is this singular experience. It, it was a professional experience, but it came it became personal because it was years and years of our lives. So I, I'm hoping that that sort of eclipses um, anything that's been recently spoken. That that yeah. that is the work. The I mean, everybody like, will have the love yeah, for the show. Have a professional. That many years spent doing something so special that people, you know, may, had a connection with it. Yes. Such a privilege. What yeah. is going on here? Like, yeah, is Kim? So was Kim? Who do you believe? I I honestly believe Sarah Jessica Parker. I, I mean, I, I, that's the thing. I mean, of course, eight, multiple years working on a TV show, there's bound to be some drama along the way. But Sarah Jessica Parker is an incredibly kind, nice person. I do not believe she inflicted such harm on Kim Cattrall to be like tweeting out, "Stay away from my family," as if Sarah Jessica Parker is like knocking down like her doors, yeah. trying to like rob her. Like it just it seems Kim Cattrall needs to calm down and let go of whatever rivalry or animosity she has for Sarah Jessica from yeah. the show. I think female dynamics are very complicated, and especially the more women you put in that dynamic. So look, these were four women. We know for sure that three of them got along really well. We see them you know, in photographs publicly all the time. Yeah. I think Kim Cattrall just didn't vibe with the group in the same way, and that's what she's feeling. So I can't say that her experience wasn't valid because maybe she did feel ostracized or different, and maybe they weren't as inclusive. We really don't know. Female Relationships are very complicated, but I do well, think I Sarah. Just, Wives, yeah, I do think Sarah Jessica <laughs> probably had the best intentions, but she was like EP of the show, and she did get the most attention, and yeah. it was her ship that she was driving. So of course she felt positive about it, but that doesn't speak to how Kim's experience right. was, you know. Yeah, I just think I can imagine how blindsided she would feel if, though, after nine years of working with someone, she's like, "We were never friends." But I don't that think she was blindsided. It was pretty much well publicized throughout the experience that Kim sort of like because it, initially Sarah Jessica, Sarah Jessica Parker was a protagonist and got the most attention, but viewers loved Samantha, so they started writing more funny lines, more scenes for Samantha, and that's when it started that conflict in the media of like, oh, now Sarah Jessica Parker but thinks Kim getting too much screen time. But wasn't that conflict just created by the media? Right. I don't think that was actually yeah. a But where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah, and also uh -huh. I think the media creating those narratives really do affect the way people feel, yeah. whether or not they're based in reality. Like, right. you know, if someone starts a rumor about you, it's gonna affect you whether or not it's true because we care about how people yeah. perceive us. That's a good point. So even if they're speaking lies and you know it's a lie, it's frustrating because it's even more frustrating when a rumor spreads that's not true about right. you. Yeah. I've heard crazy stuff about Kim Cattrall yeah. um, in terms of se uh, sex, in the three, sex in the City 3 movie. Yeah. So what I heard, and my understanding of it, is that they all signed on to do a movie, and then when Kim Cattrall couldn't, like, I, get, I think she had she was saying that she wanted the producer or director on the film to like also produce her script, and right. if they didn't produce it, she was going to pull out of the movie. And they had everyone hired, ready to go, ready to shoot, and then she, like, so Sex and the City fans are very angry yeah, with yeah. Kim Cattrall for taking away their third movie. But wasn't the and I'm pissed! But wasn't the second movie bad and moderately racist as well? So Weren't bad. they just on camels and Listen designer clothing? Like, oh, we're in Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. We're Dhabi. Four white women. Yeah. So bad. No. Yeah. So bad. I do not want a Let third movie. Let me just movie. say one thing. I really badly want a third movie. And I understand that the second movie is bad. It's not good. It's tone deaf. But I really like watching them. Yeah, what could we fair. possibly get in a third movie that I wanna... we did not get from 10 oh, years maybe. of you the show? Can't, do you can't. Did you watch the show? Yes. And did you watch both the movies? Uh, religiously. So what are you talking about? Be, we need to uh, but know. But after, I know, I, we know everything. I, I got a storyline. After that second line. film, Miranda was runs so... for governor oh of New York. No. How about oh, that? Oh, yeah, Miranda runs.
Did she I love win that. this time? I love Yay! That. Let's write it. I don't I want it. I feel like I'm Karen in your jacket. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, when did we become Karen in jacket? Oh my God. No, but I kind of agree. I don't yeah. want it. I think sometimes you can't beat, you can't keep beating the horse. It's been dead. Just le but let it I be see dead. How, I want to see how Carrie and um, Big settled into their life together. Do you? Uh, yes. <laughs> Oh my God, I do. They aged. That's they right. Aged. <laughs> they got old. They got old. Yeah. They still see, have you know, money. I want to see what, what it's but like. I would say, like, I feel like hoe ho culture has become more mainstream lately, and it would be great to see Samantha, like, on Tinder. Like, Yo, she thank was, you. I did not see she, she yeah. agree with me. Right. Like, Samantha is, is 55. I, listen, no, I want to see a 75-year-old woman <laughs> yeah. on Tinder getting dicked up on the nightly. Yeah. I think we need that kind of representation, okay? Yeah. Old yeah. women need to get theirs, too, and that's why I think Samantha, they, this movie can't happen without Samantha. No. And it shouldn't they, happen in period. But I think we need representation. Old women getting theirs. You know what? No. I'm into it. Yeah, so, okay. I, Miranda I think, running for Congress. I think we great. so many great ideas. There's this, what, what's Charlotte got to do, though? Charlotte's Just mad. Charlotte. She's dead. Just, no, no. <laughs> Charlotte died. No. We could do it without her. Again, <laughs> Charlotte's like taking soul cycle and pottery classes. Like, we know. Charlotte, Charlotte is planning her children's like, birthday. I love Britney's, Britney's movie. It's just like, yeah. it's, she's right. it's just so boring. It's just like yeah. four white, old white women just like being white women. Am I wrong? <laughs> Isn't it just four old white women being white women? That pretty much is yeah. the tagline for Sex in the City right there. Okay. I don't know. What if they're all suddenly broke? <laughs> that I would watch. Would you watch that? Yeah. Okay. My favorite is the opening of the second movie when Sarah Jessica Parker is talking about her and Big, and she's like, our penthouse was a little too big for us, so we decided to move downtown two stories to be exact. <laughs> and they bought the floor like below them. Uh, and that was how they opened it. It was great. It's a, with this said, I know I am like fully against a, a third movie, but I do, I'm obsessed with the franchise. If a third movie came out, would you go see it? I think I can't now after this. Oh, game. I've just taken, oh, no. I think I've just I taken like a I'm pretty like, solid stance. Did you watch Doctor Ford's testimony? No. Yeah. Done. Move on. I don't so know. I think, I think I'm gonna. Miranda runs for governor. Cynthia Nixon. She has the free time. Let's cast her. Let's do it. Yes. And then raise in bagels with capers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll give them out at the movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time for our next guest. You may know Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, Sacasa as the writer, producer, and director of the hit CW teen drama Riverdale. But now he's the force behind Netflix's upcoming Supernatural series, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Today he joins us with actress Michelle Gomez, who stars in the show as Mary Wardell, Sabrina's favorite teacher who turns evil. Take a look. Please give a warm build brunch welcome to Roberto Aguirre Sacasa and Michelle Gomez. Thank you so much for being here. I, I anyone who knows me or anyone who's watched this show knows that I love Satan, I love darkness, I love witches. Yes. And true. I was a huge fan order. of the Sabrina, the old Sabrina show. And when I watched this, I felt like you made this for me. Mm. I am just You're just welcome. So, so grateful. I love how dark it is. The balance of good and evil in this show is so well done with everything from the casting and everything. Um, but how, like, what inspired you to go this dark and with Sabrina? You know, I think um, growing up, I really, uh, I really loved all of the Archie comic book characters. Sabrina is one of the Archie comic book characters. But I also was a fanatic for horror movies and horror novels, you know, Stephen King novels. Um, and uh, uh, a long time ago, I thought, gosh, you know, it would be so fun to do a mashup of Sabrina the Teenage Witch with something like The Exorcist or Rosemary's Baby. Um, and so about four years ago, I did a comic book called The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, um, which was, was basically retelling Sabrina's origin 
like uh, she was the kid from The Omen. Yeah. And, uh, and, and people really responded uh, to that and then kind of one thing led to another and <laughs> here we are. <laughs> And what was the casting process like? Because I also was a fan of the original series, and then I love the new additions of like the cousin and the teacher that she has this connection to. So what was that? I have to like? tell you, this lady here, <laughs> I and I've said this to her, I've never seen an audition like the one she gave to play <laughs> oh uh, Mary Wardle, Madam Satan. She had everyone in the palm of her hand. It was so, so good. Uh, 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 the, the casting was great. I mean, everyone, you know, we got all of our first choices. And, and, and everyone just is this part. Michelle is... Madam Michelle yeah. is Madam Satan. So good. It is so good. So so good. So good. How Thank did you me. get involved in the project exactly? Um, uh, well, the the script came to me via my um, my my representatives, and uh, and then it was it was just full steam ahead. That's yeah. all I would talk about. That's all I wanted to do. <laughs> um, I'd come off the back of another project, and I thought I would never get a chance to play another part like that again. And then. In came Madam Satan. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it just, yeah, it became my life's work to make that happen. And what is the preparation like when you are a satanic sorceress? <laughs> it's, uh, it's not, it's, it's um, this doesn't reflect well on me. <laughs> it's, not, it's not much of a stretch. <laughs> um, but, uh, but all joking aside, uh, the, every character, regardless of whether we've, we're, we're just a handmaiden from, from, from the devil possessing a body, would suggest that we're not a real person person, um, but Roberto manages to somehow uh, give us all, deliver well-drawn characters of three-dimensional uh, species that um, you end up caring about, and you shouldn't, and you shouldn't care about Madam Satan, but of course you do. Well, the, 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 incre the incredible scene, the first episode, when your character makes that transformation, the next scene, when she wa when she <laughs> walks down the hall in her hair, oh, the, it's the greatest subtle difference. entrance it is so the most iconic. Time. I was, I couldn't, I, I couldn't help but go, yes! <laughs> yeah. No, I would not say that. Yeah. I was like, it was a there was a take yeah. where I was doing of yes, course because your entire take, posture yeah. changed. Like yeah. it was like your transformation. Into it was that incredible. Was so yeah. But what no. I love about your character is, and which is so bad to show, is how three dimensional everyone is, and like kind of in a way she's actually looking out for Sabrina, perhaps a little bit selfishly, but to, for Sabrina to reach her total fullest potential of her power, which is like kind of this like dark way of female empowerment, which I kind of like. There, there, that is absolutely there. There are issues, there are themes that we, that we touch <clears throat> upon. Uh, mainly female empowerment is absolutely there. Um, bullying is an issue, individualism, you know, inclusiveness. Um, we touch on all of these themes beautifully and in a way that is channeled through the characters that you fall in love with. Um, Madam Satan, I feel, really is there to take down the patriarchy uh. that we are all extremely bored of now. It, <laughs> it, it, it's, 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 it's over, guys, right? You know, and I think a lot of men would agree with that as well. You know, th there's a lot of good men out there, ladies, you know, and they're not all bad. And, uh, and it's time for us to stand up. And I love that Madam Satan is there whispering in Sabrina's ear, um, who is... She packs a punch, that girl. She's yeah. built like a Jack Russell, but she can bite. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so she has that thing, you know, she has a glint in her eye. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not just Sabrina, that's Kieran and Shipka. Yeah. That girl has a yes. glint yes. in her eye. And, and so does Madam Satan. And so, you know, it's a sort of, it's a kind of a match made in heaven, really. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and it's exciting <laughs> yeah. to help her cross to the dark side. And, and I really think that that speaks to a lot of, um, our audience out there that are coming to that stage in their life where they're, they're going from innocence mm -hmm. to adulthood. Right. And, and that's tricky. That's a tricky transition. And, and I think this show will help them navigate that. You know, there's something for every one of them. Shape, size, color, breed, whatever. Breed? Yeah. <laughs> breed. Yeah, we'll take uh, it. Yeah. I love dog. <laughs> uh, and um, so that's why I think this, there's, there's no show, genuinely, I really passionately believe there's no show like this out there right now that will speak to so many people yeah. totally. on so many levels. Because the female empowerment's not just on the witch witchcraft side. You see her in her school. Yeah making sure that everybody feels included. So why was that important to put into the storyline? Kind of reflecting well, what's going on with teens right now. Yeah, you know, when, 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 when um, I had, for my, my, when I first met Kiernan, we, we talked about, before there was even a script, um, uh, we talked about how the, the show was inherently about a girl who always questioned authority. Mm -hmm. 
and who always stood up for the underdog. Mm -hmm. That was just who she was. You guys know, you know, down on Wall Street, there's that giant yeah. Wall Street ball, yeah. and you remember that they that they put up the statue of the fearless girl, mm -hmm. yeah. and there was some controversy. The guy who did the ball didn't want the fearless girl to be standing opposite. Mm -hmm. When I pitched the show, I had a picture of the fear of the ball, and then I had a picture of the fearless girl, and I said, "That's Sabrina. She's standing up to this, right. and she will mm -hmm. always stand up uh, against the 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 forces of evil." against the dark lord, against the evil principal, <laughs> against the, the football players who are hurting her friend Susie. That's just, we just bake that into the character. Um, um, and for Kiernan, it was really important that Sabrina be a role model mm -hmm. for young girls. And uh, even though she herself is a young, young woman. Uh, uh, and that's just something that we've always, that, that's a theme that we come back to over and over again. It's, it's, it's sort of, baked into the DNA of, of witches and witchcraft. Definitely. And speaking of when you pitched the show, um, it's really interesting the kind of the, the life this idea had. And originally, you, you maybe were going to introduce Sabrina in Riverdale. Mm -hmm. what, what ultimately was the decision you decide not to do that? You know, it was a couple of things. Um, I think that the, um, the big, the, the um, you know, some of the decisions happened way above my pay grade. Okay. Uh, for me, the, 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 and, I, and, and in a way, it would have been so much easier to do this on the CW and have it as a companion piece to Riverdale. The, the advantage of going to a place like Netflix is twofold. One is we can really make it a horror series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like we can really have some gore and we can really have some scares and we can really talk about things like cannibalism and we can, <laughs> yeah. and we can have the devil, you know, you know the, the devil can be the villain. Um, the other thing is, you know, when you do a network show, every episode has to be 41 minutes mm -hmm. and 40 seconds. Right. And uh, on Netflix, the episode can be, you know, anywhere from 32 minutes to uh, 60 minutes. Wow. So if I want to turn in a 54-minute episode or a 52 or 3, uh, so it's nice to be able to explore the characters a little more, um, with a little more dimension, a little more uh, time and breath. Yeah. yeah. Will we ever see these two worlds collide ever? Oh, lady, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> I would love it. I would love it. I have, there, there are a couple, like two or three stories that would be great stories. Uh -huh. I mean, right now, I think the focus is on launching nice. Sabrina and making sure Sabrina stands on her own two feet, which she does very nicely, and to make sure that uh, season three of Riverdale is, is the best season of Riverdale. I think it is. But I would love there to be a crossover. I think we would too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but um, going to Netflix, which I'm so happy Netflix like invests in shows like this because like what Shannon was saying, I, I love fantasy and magic. What I really liked about it is your exploration of magic is incredibly dark. And the way we're used to, like, you know, Harry Potter, maybe Lord of the Rings, it's more of a lighter view of what magic can be. So was when you went to Netflix, that ultimately convinced you like, okay, let's make it this dark, but you always had that in mind, like it was always it was always pretty dark and you know I always said stuff like you know you're not it's very you're not going to see like witches flying around on brooms yeah. you're not going to see fire you know fireballs well I mean never <laughs> say never and 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 you in fact you might see stuff like that but that it was it would be more occult right. mm -hmm. and and it would be it would be more like the witchcraft in in Rosemary's Baby mm -hmm. or you know, there's a wonderful Italian horror film called Suspiria. Mm -hmm. uh, that it would be more like that as opposed to Harry Potter, yeah. cloaks, and all that, all that stuff. That it would be that it would be darker, um, and that, that 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 was sort of always baked into the DNA of mm -hmm. of, of the vision for the show. Yeah. Well, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. It worked. Oh, yeah. so good. I watched it with my cat, and my cat literally gulped during the scene, <laughs> and I was like, maybe she's too young for this. <laughs> I love it so much. Roberto and Michelle, thank you thank so you. much for being here. Such a pleasure. Thank you. You can thank catch you. The yeah. Chilling Adventures of Sabrina when it drops on Netflix on October 26th. That's all from us. We'll see you Monday, same time, same table. Thank you, thank you guys.